As we begin week three of our journey together, we reflect on part two of the vow of nonviolence that says, I vow to carry out in my life the love and example of Jesus by refusing to retaliate in the face of provocation and violence, by persevering in nonviolence of tongue and heart. And so as I was thinking about this, it reminded me of a story. There's a teacher in the Ignatian Solidarity Network who cares deeply about environmental issues. Um, and she told a story in which she got tissues for every teacher in her department. Um, and as she handed them to another teacher, they said, you got the wrong kind. And she asked for clarification because she didn't know you could get the wrong kind of tissue. Um, and the other teacher proceeded to lecture her uh, for not getting tissues made out of 100% recycled paper. How could she do something like this and not consider the environmental impact? Um, and so it was clear that this person who was sharing the story experienced uh, you know, a sense of shame and shock um, as she was trying her best um, and, and missed the mark. And so I think that many of us have probably found ourselves on both sides of the story in our own lives, um, either just interpersonally or as we do our environmental work, um, frustrated by others not living up to our expectations or ourselves missing the mark in, in other people's eyes. Um, and so I think it can become really easy to become defensive or kind of um, a warrior for justice and, and want to retaliate on the interpersonal level, um, as well as on the macro level when we feel deeply the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Um, and as we see headlines um, in which people are suffering um, deeply and immediately um, due to environmental degradation. And so this week we're invited to reflect on how the gospel of nonviolence reminds us that we're called to remain loving and forgiving in the face of this violence and environmental degradation. And so there are a few examples of ways that we can integrate this into our lives. Ronald Rollheiser wrote the book, A Holy Longing. And in it, he talks about the four non-negotiable pillars of Christian spirituality. And I thought it was so fascinating that one of the pillars was actually about a mellowness of heart and spirit. And so in his book, he, he talks about how sometimes we can become so rigid um, and so unforgiving um, in, in our spirituality and in our quest for justice. And so he says in the book about mellowness of heart and spirit, sanctity has to do with gratitude. To be a saint is to be fueled by gratitude, nothing more, nothing less. And I think St. Ignatius would agree he believed that the sin of ingratitude was the cause beginning and origin of all evil in the world, which is why he encouraged um, his followers to do the daily examine and to um, enter into their day in a spirit of gratitude. So again, in his book, Rollheiser says, sanctity is as much about having a mellow heart as it is about believing and doing the right thing itself. It's as much about a proper energy as about truth. Um, and in his book, he also um, talks about how Gustavo Gutierrez, the father of liberation theology, um, would say that a healthy spirituality um, has to have a, a prayerful component, has to have a practice of justice, um, and then it also has to have a component of those things in our lives that keep our souls mellow and grateful. So he mentions good friends, wine drinking, creativity, and healthy leisure. And so Gutierrez says the task of a Christian is to transform the world through love and justice, but he's clear that we will not succeed if those actions are coming from a place of anger or guilt. Another example of this in our faith tradition comes from Hildegard of Bingen. Um, St. Hildegard had this concept that she talked about, which was veriditas, right? The greening power of God um, that grows and that allows goodness to flourish. Um, and in opposition to that, she talked about aridtas or a sense of aridity, uh, dryness, and that unchecked, this can lead to a sense of a barren, arid condition um, that invites spiritual distress. And so I think our invitation this week um, is really to consider um, where our, our work for justice is, is issuing from in ourselves. Um, is it this place of loving and greening and nonviolence and forgiveness? Um, or is it coming um, from more of an arid and dry um, and fear-driven place? Um, 
an image that I think we can use to um, kind of guide us in this in our work for justice and and kind of finding that balance of a mellowness of spirit of of deeply feeling um, and engaging in the pain of the world but also remaining grateful um, and remaining hopeful is the burning bush right so Moses saw this bush that was on fire but not consumed. So I think our invitation is to consider how we remain on fire for these issues that we care about um, without becoming consumed and bitter um, and overwhelmed um, and sometimes unforgiving or ungrateful. The second part of the vow is about not retaliating in the face of provocation and violence. Right. And so um, the late Christian theologian Walter Wink um, was uh, very well known for his theology of nonviolence. Um, and he unpacks the language of turn the other cheek in Matthew's gospel. Right. Um, and so I'll provide a link below so that you can hear him explain it. Um, but I think uh, his invitation reminds us that um, in remaining in this grateful spirit um, and this forgiving spirit, that doesn't mean that we are being doormats um, or that we are not being change makers for justice, um, but that Jesus was really pointing us to a, a third way, not fight, not flight, but an active nonviolent challenge to the oppressors and the violence that we see in the world today. And John Deere, um, Another great advocate for nonviolence explains that the people who've taught us the most about Jesus's nonviolent teachings are probably Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi. So I will close with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So my prayer for us this week is that we can look deeply in our hearts and in our ministry and our work for integral ecology and creation care and to consider are there ways that we are mimicking the logic of violence um, that has gotten us into this space of deep environmental degradation and how can we look to Jesus and to the Trinity and to St. Francis and other models from our faith tradition to cultivate a, a mellowness of heart, a veriditas that will create a wellspring uh, within us to help us continue to contribute to the mighty river of justice and peace that we strive to bring about in this world.